Section 3 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strip Poker and Paddle Parties There surely must be some way of getting into the movies without uh, stooping below one's own level. So thought Jane Evans who had been in Hollywood some weeks without making any impression on casting directors, uh, other than to invoke insinuating invitations. Surely the high-class stars were not so coarse. These men who talked so openly were just the riffraff. It could not possibly be otherwise. The newspapers said such nice things about the great actors and actresses. Soon the opportunity came to Jane to mingle in the social whirl of the much-talked-of celebrities. She had left her telephone number at all the studios. One day she was telephoned to by some mysterious person. She was told that it was a business call. She went to the studio designated and found a young man pawing over some photographs in a wire basket. She noticed that a picture of herself that she had left hopefully lay segregated from the others. She entered without being seen and was almost taken off her feet when she heard the young man say... I am rustling up some new ones for the boss's party tonight. The young man picked up Jane's photograph and was going to say something else when he noticed her presence. Ah, this is Miss... I am, said Jane. You telephoned for me. Do you ride and do you swim? he asked with a peculiar glance towards another man who sat playing with another photograph and who was just then ruining it utterly by poking a hole in it with a paper knife. I do a little of each. All right, said the young man. Wait. The youth went into an inner office and threw the picture on a desk by which sat a very handsome man well known as a screen favorite. He was playing with a dog and drinking a cocktail. Not bad, he said, and sized up the picture. I'll take it. He went towards the door and peeked out carefully. He came back and said, in a very cool and deliberate way, She is new on me. She'll do. The young man came back and was all attention and politeness. Mr. <laughs> well, the boss says that he will be pleased to have you meet some of the members of the company at his house tonight, he said, and he wants you to be there promptly at midnight. He wrote an address and a telephone number and gave it to Jane and showed her the way out. Midnight, Jane asked of herself. How odd. But then it occurred to her that perhaps the great men worked late, and she thought nothing more about it. She made up her mind to take the opportunity and to let no chance to meet the great and near great go by. She spent the evening at her apartment and after having written an optimistic letter to her mother, she dressed in her best and soon looked very charming. Promptly at midnight, she arrived at the address given. It was one of the largest houses in the city and stood buried among magnificent trees in the middle of a park-like garden. She approached the entrance. But the house was dark, but for a small light in the hall. She thought at first that she was at the wrong house, but rang the bell. At length the door was opened by the young man she had met at the office, and he asked her in. You are on time, <laughs> he laughed. Ah, that's enough. I know now that you haven't been long in the movies. 
I guess they'll show up, though. They do at times. The young man asked her to take a seat. Whether she removed her wraps or not did not seem to bother him. He sat down and lighted a cigarette, threw the match on the floor, and smoked. He remarked suddenly that his name was Mac. He made a move now and then, as if he would sit down close by Jane. But she looked towards the door and refrained from doing so. Jane saw a light button and deliberately turned on the lights. Go as far as you like, said the young man with a raucous laugh. Most of them don't want no lights. Jane pretended not to hear him. Is that you, Mac? Suddenly came a drawling voice from upstairs. Yes, sir, replied Mac, all attention. I didn't know you was in. Is the little one there? The voice asked. She has just come in. She's kicking about more light. Give her a drink or two till I get down, said the voice. I'm having a row with Clara. Who is Clara? Jane asked and rose to her feet. Uh, nobody, replied Mac. I think she is his wife. Uh, that's nothing. Jane, frightened, got ready to leave when she heard a volley of laughter outside, and four boisterous persons came rushing in. Jane now could see that they were under the influence of drink. They made a rush for the decanters and the sideboard. They all seemed to know where everything was in the house and helped themselves liberally. Then one of the men noticed Jane and said to Mac, Mac, who have we here? Gee, you didn't give me a chance to introduce her, said Mac. She is a new friend of the boss, and... Great God, snapped one of the women. Is he through with Clara already? Of course, laughed the other woman. Clara has lasted longer than any of them. Gee, what do you expect? Where is his nibs? asked one of the men. Upstairs scrapping, said Mac. But he's told me to tell you... That's enough, cried one of the women. Get the cards and the lubricants, and we don't care if he never comes down. Jane found herself swept onto a chair on the card table, and soon a poker game was in full progress. She was given an allotment of chips and had no idea whether they represented money or not. Or, if so, how much... She did not know what to do or say, and nobody seemed to care. Ante up, said Mac. Gee, it's hell to be popular. The game progressed. Jane knew enough of poker to keep up her play. Soon, one of the women lost all her chips. Jane thought she would now learn what the stakes represented, she had heard of games where thousands of dollars changed hands in a few minutes. The losing woman stood up. Jane then witnessed a remarkable performance. The woman calmly unhooked her shirtwaist and stripped it off and threw it on the floor. She picked up her cards and continued to play after lighting a cigarette. Uh, are you warm? Jane asked in bewilderment. Yes, laughed the woman. Wait till you get your turn. <laughs> Quit your kidding. The other woman was the next one to lose out, and she calmly removed her skirt and flung it away. Jane had never heard of the popular game of strip poker and consequently concluded that her companions were losing their minds, as well as their chips and clothes. She felt a sinking feeling as she suddenly saw her last chips gone. She noticed that they all stared at her, 
The men especially. Pay your loss, laughed one of the men. Strip off or something. She said she did not understand. They explained to her that the game consisted of a system of undressing and that the losers had to strip off some garment each time he or she lost their last chips. Jane kicked off one of her slippers and smiled. The men looked disgusted, and the women turned up their noses, and the game went on. While Jane was so busy trying to devise some plan by which she could get out of the house, she found her last chips again swept away in a large jackpot. <laughs> Nothing can be stripped off that some other player has removed before, laughed one of the men. No waists or skirts or shoes. She became fearfully indignant. She arose and she thought it was time to leave. She is crawfishing cried one of the women. Make her pay, Al. The man who answered the name of Al put his cigar more firmly into the corner of his big flabby mouth and arose. He took hold of her and unhooked the back of her dress. The others roared, and the other man wanted to know if he wanted any help. Jane began to cry, she tried to tear away from the man. He sunk his dirty fingernails into her white full arm. Just then, the boss was heard coming down. He reached the scene of the poker table with incredible haste. He looked at Jane, who was wiping a tear, and tried to look calm. Mac tried to intervene and explain. The big handsome host took him by the neck and flung him into a corner. He picked Jane up bodily and carried her to a nearby sofa. There'll be no rough stuff while I am here. This is one of my homes, he said with apparent chivalry. Nick's on that. Who dragged this nice young girl into a strip poker game, he demanded. For God's sake, don't you know a lady when you see one? The two men stood like whipped dogs, and Mac sneaked out of the room. But Jane did not see how her supposed champion winked to the men and how they exchanged glances. The big man walked over and sat down by Jane. Look here he said consolingly. Nobody is going to get me nor any of my homes in bad. I am going to be your friend. At last, thought Jane, she had met one of Screenland's noblemen, although he was rather rough in manner. But he seemed to have a heart as big as his body. It was past two o'clock, and Jane said something about departing. Don't spoil the party, pleaded the host. There ain't nobody here yet. I expect a raft of ladies and gentlemen. The bunch seldom gets here before two. Little did Jane know that the foregoing was merely an overture to one of the great Bacchanalian parties, to one of the nauseating orgies which are the order of the day in movie land. Or perhaps... It would be more correct to style them the order of the night or nights. It was not long before the parlors of the house began to fill up. The most remarkable etiquette seemed to prevail. Whether a man preceded a woman through an open door, or if he conversed ghibli with his cigar or cigarette in his mouth, mattered not at all. Everybody called each other by their first name, and all of them smiled in a peculiar way when they met Jane. The men smiled pleasantly, 
and the women critically. Jane recognized some of the leaders of the profession and was glad to have a chance to view them and hear them at close range. In a semicircle around a fireplace sat a young, handsome man with a name like one of the country's most famous playwrights. He was jabbing a hypodermic needle into the pretty white arm of a young girl, and then others were watching him intently, and still others sat in a stupor and leered. The girl evidently had not the courage to inject the narcotic drug into her own arm. She was a novice. Then the needle was passed around, just like the pipe of peace was passed by the noble American Indians on the same spot in days of yore. A famous girl, in the meantime, was drinking perfume, and another was pouring perfume from the bottles on the dressing table on lumps of sugar and eating it. The supply of liquor seemed inexhaustible. As fast as the bottles were emptied, fresh ones took their places. Bottles that had cost as much money as would maintain an ordinary family for a week were emptied almost in one swallow. Concoctions were mixed that even old drinkers had never before heard of. The women were the first to show the effects. Their high kicking left nothing to the imagination. The men encouraged them. One pair shimmied three quarters nude. There was nothing concealed in the climax to their dance. The onlookers shook their shoulders and bodies in unison with the dancers. Suddenly the host, from the far end of the big room, called for silence. In his arms he carried what looked like ordinary flat sticks of wood. Painted on each was a number. At the same time, Mac, his assistant, passed about among the women, pinning a paper tag with a number on it to each of their backs. Not knowing what was coming, Jane permitted him to give her one. She thought it was a new game. It was to her. Possibly something like the old-time donkey parties they used to have at home. Not a bit. Then Mac went around among the men and collected twenty dollars from each of them. The money he placed in a heap on the table in front of the host. The girls were told to gather in a corner and turn their backs to the men, leaving their numbers exposed to view. The new one is eighteen, said Mac in a low tone as he approached the table. The host slipped that number into the table drawer. All right, let's go, cried the host. Mac spun the wheel that lay on the table. Number six, yelled the host. A dozen men grabbed for it. The victor turned about and made a rush for the girl marked six. Maudlin shouts and suggestive grimaces greeted them. Mac handed the girl twenty dollars as the pair walked to another part of the house. They were seen no more. Some paddle party, said Mac, as without hitch of any kind, one man after another drew his girl. The girl took her money, and each pair in turn vanished. During the sale of the paddles, as Jane learned the wooden discs were called, she had overheard enough to let her know what it meant. One of the women told her of a paddle party she had attended, and what a fine time everybody had, and money besides. Jane found it easy to slip upstairs and find her coat. It was four o'clock. She passed out of the house unnoticed, walked and ran until she was a dozen blocks away. It was broad daylight when she reached home. Her absence was not remarked until the room was almost emptied. 
Then Mac noticed she was gone. He hunted everywhere. He went back and told the host. Why in the hell didn't you watch her? He growled at Mac as he slipped Jane's number out of the drawer and onto the table and replaced it with another. In this way, the host drew a girl. Mac drew the blank that represented Jane. The big room was empty now, but from every part of the house came suppressed laughter. The lights went out. Thus ended the function. It was regarded as a great success. The morning sun shone through the windows, but the house was stale with tobacco and liquor reeks and the sickening odor of dope. Here and there lay torn women's garments, and in the halls were bits of lingerie. End of section three.